I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is RK Mark. Hello everyone. Hi everybody. And welcome welcome to, RK Mark. to RK Mark GM Tools Designing Interesting Dungeons. So to start off with, let's talk about what we mean by a dungeon. What is a dungeon? Well, so, obviously a dungeon is that that really cool ancestry by Roll for Combat uh, <laughs> that you can play as a dungeon where you're just a sapient dungeon and you go around as a, the avatar of a dungeon fighting things and sometimes going into your own extra planar dungeon body and fighting the floors and revealing secrets of yourself and learning more about um, your past or other things within you. Really though, when, when folks think about like sort of the archetypical tabletop RPG dungeon, it's like, you know, an underground space that has like stone walls and a bunch of connected rooms and there's traps and treasures and monsters and you fight them until ultimately you confront some kind of a boss within and well, those are like the, stronger and wealthier those than those are like the like. labyrinth heritage of the dungeon ancestry <laughs> but you, that's missing the one where you're a giant tree or a big monster that everybody's yeah. walking inside of or a tower or uh what other was that? oh an archipelago where each island is like a floor of the dungeon so like while the word dungeon may sort of bring to mind that more like traditional thing that is more similar to well an actual castle dungeon the word dungeon in a tabletop rpg sense generally is you know a a complex of interconnected areas that influence each other in some way that characters explore and there is some degree of a timer or time pressure or way that it evolves based on their interactions with it that's right uh, yeah, that's basically what dungeons are. So, like Mark was saying, you know, it could be it could be a bunch of areas in a forest. It could be a it could be like you know a giant overland area. It could be like an underwater palace. It could be it could be a physical a natural structure. It could be a you know a structure that's made by like humans or another ancestry. It could be any variety of things. That's true. And uh, basically, the idea is it's a larger complex. They it may be separated into rooms, but they may be metaphorical rooms. Floors, maybe, but they mm -hmm. may be metaphorical floors that it might not have more than one. And uh, together, they make up a coherent gauntlet of sort of uh, challenges or uh, locations for a group to explore and overcome. So one of the things to think about when you're making a dungeon is what is the what is the goal of putting that dungeon in there? And uh, what is the scope that you want for it? You know, if you're looking for, hey, you know, I want to create this because I want to answer the question, what is underneath the city? That's pretty different from, I want to create this because I need something to get my players up by an entire level or something that they're going to be enmeshed in for a long period of time. So getting a sense of your scope and goals right in the beginning is uh, is important because when you're designing a, if you're designing like a little dungeon that it's just going to be like one session or something like that, then your, your time between, you know, the introduction of the dungeon and the resolution of the dungeon is going to be pretty fast. Whereas if you're designing a larger dungeon, the larger the dungeon is, the more sort of different plot beats and story beats and evolutions you need to keep it interesting. I think, you know, one of the, one of the main pitfalls that you can see with dungeons, particularly like in a published adventure where there's not as much space is you can have a dungeon where it's like, well, you know, uh, we have moot guards A and B and, you know, these 10 rooms, all that they have is some combination of moot guards A and B. And like, that's not, that's not going to be particularly interesting if you're doing that, that same thing over and over again. Right. So the larger your dungeon gets, the more variety that you need to, to keep it interesting. So I want to drill down into that actually. So like, as the overleshy of narrative for Paizo, you know, you've designed or looked over probably more different dungeons in the Pathfinder 2 era than anybody else has in terms of just how many, even little dungeons, sometimes big dungeons, usually little dungeons usually just little because of board play, board yeah. play, right? And so I like where you were going with what you just said. So before we get into designing interesting dungeons... Mm -hmm. How can we design the most uninteresting dungeons? Because okay. if we figure out which kind of dungeons are uninteresting, 
that will help us determine how to design interesting dungeons. So you started this out by saying an uninteresting dungeon is one full of tons of encounters that are just remixes of two different MOOC stat blocks and varying numbers in a different room. And it's just that MOOC again. An uninteresting dungeon is a area that is comprised... The most uninteresting dungeon would be a linear, a linear sequence of... Um, of rectangular featureless rooms with no story or history in which um, combats of a monotonous difficulty are repeatedly faced and uh, there are no opportunities for role play or alternate solutions you just continue to grind through monster after monster until the monsters are defeated or you are okay so that seems like actually a very high bar to clear to make an, <laughs> uh, an interesting dungeon like you would have to try very hard for it but surely there's a way to make an uninteresting dungeon without having all of those features crammed together into like the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate soporific board. boredom fest. Okay, yeah. So um, another thing that could make your dungeon uninteresting is if you um, if the dungeon doesn't have a goal or objective, mm -hmm. and you come out of the dungeon not feeling like you've learned or discovered anything. So, like, if the dungeon is, like, this dungeon is the basement. If this dungeon is an undercity, the undercity is sewers. In the sewers, you know, you fight. In the sewers, you fight, like, a large number of kobolds. And the kobolds have no personality. They have no aim. They all fight to the death. And uh, then you leave. Okay. And then nothing else happens. After and nothing that. else happens after that. There that would also be that could also be uninteresting, even if like the, even if the map in that case wasn't completely a like a linear thing. Uh, yeah, people are asking questions in chats about octagonal rooms, or um, Kitchev said their GM may have been taking notes on oh, how yeah. to build the uninteresting. So, uh, so from your example. Rooms. So one of the things, uh, one of the things about rooms that that's interesting with uh, with published adventures too is that you're considering that GMs are going to need to draw it. So there's a push and pull between interesting room shapes and complexity of reproducing on a map. Uh, so usually we try to look at things like, be careful with those 45 degree angles because if you have squares that are cut in half and then people are arguing about whether is that square in the map or not in the map. Uh, but having a variety of, of uh, room sizes and shapes as well as a variety of features in the room that people can interact with is important. Because when, when, when I mentioned before in sort of like the, the unoptimal dungeon, you have like all of your rooms are, all of your rooms are rectangular and featureless. So that means that, you know, there's no difficult terrain. There's no like something that you can interact, nothing in the room that you can interact with to change the features of it. There's no, you know, there's no traps. There's no like, oh, this, oh, another thing about the uninteresting dungeon would be that the uninteresting dungeon has, um, has identical has identical ten foot ceiling height throughout the entire thing as well because that's another thing you can vary up is uh, is elevation, uh, particularly if you have PCs and NPCs and monsters and stuff like that that might be able to fly and therefore make use of the third dimension. Um, your uninteresting dungeon is also not going to involve like wind or water or other elemental features that might that might switch things up. Um, like, there's not going to be a chance to, like, oh, I'm going to swim down here to get the other alternative. Uh, yeah, the longer, there's a, so you're still, are you still wanting me to answer about, like, what is your uninteresting dungeon? No, I or think that's a answer? good point. So I'm going to mm -hmm. try to, to sort of focus that down. Yeah. Into its essence, an uninteresting dungeon is a dungeon that is um, either capricious and arbitrary or repetitive. Mm-hmm especially where it goes on for a long time with either of those factors. Now, just because uh, we're saying that an uninteresting dungeon could be capricious and arbitrary does not mean that an emergent dungeon that you create by using D100 tables can't be really interesting. But in that case, I would highly recommend rather than just like literally on the seat of your pants rolling a D100 table just before throwing the next room in, to use a few D100 tables to try to come up with an emergent dungeon idea ahead of time and then find a way to um, sort of use improv skills to create a through line that those random roles help you generate. And uh, I say this having done, I've done dungeons and even like made like a little mini system where Everything is generated randomly, but then used improv skills to try to create a through line or, or a 
a sort of definition or um, story behind whatever the random rolls yeah. were generated. And that one also, like, it's not going to tell you exactly what's there. It might be like, you know, there's a, there's an encounter here. Like, there's a merchant here. There's a puzzle here. There's something in here that has to do with music or whatever. So it, it shakes things up in that way by its very nature. So I would say that, you know, the uninteresting dungeon has a lack of player agency and choice in terms of how they approach it. Um, and it uh, it's monotonous. Yes. So, turning that around on its head, mm -hmm. okay, an interesting dungeon is one where there is agency and choice, where there's a story behind it or something that is sort of a through line. Even if it was generated randomly, you can find a through line. Like when Linda was talking about music puzzles, which were just like on one of our random D100 tables and one of the dungeons just kept rolling it all the time, even though it was a 1% chance. So, like... That dungeon was later discovered was like, you know, like the goddess of music had um, had a, like a cleric who had come to that dungeon and set up all these music puzzles. And that was just something that sort of was an emergent property. But mm -hmm. it there are ways to go about things that are done randomly. But obviously, if you plan in advance, then whether you do it randomly or not, it makes it easier than if you have to do it on the fly. Anything that gives you a through line, that gives you options, that gives you a story that makes it feel like it's alive and it's a place. And one of be the things that's important dungeon. for feeling alive and having a place is that among the inhabitants of the dungeon, having different goals and motivations and perspectives. You know, there might be some inhabitants of your dungeon that are like, you know, mindless ooze that just wants to eat. Uh, and you know, and then you might have some inhabitant of the dungeon who's like, you know, this is the this is the necromancer who's trying to like create undead. But then you also have someone who's like, oh, you know, this is the alchemist who is trying to catch up to the necromancer and believes that the better way to deal with uh, the better way to deal with things is to make like flesh golems or whatever. Or you might have somebody who's like, you might have rivalries. You might have people who have their doubts about like the leader that's there and whether they want to work with them still. You might have somebody who's, you know, you might have people who can be convinced over onto your side. You might have different groups that have come to this place at different times and whether they're all still there and currently in a rivalry, you might have signs of a group that was there before, whether that's, you know, whether that's in terms of written records that they've left behind or objects that they've left behind or inscriptions or things like that that let you see how things were before. Right. An interesting dungeon has creatures with their own goals, agendas, and personalities, which allows the PCs to interact with them. Even if they're mostly hostile, mm -hmm. it gives the opportunity to understand what's going on, potentially to take advantage of those goals and desires of the different groups to uh, use them to their advantage. Even if it's, so, it's something as simple as like, you know, minions of this type are like mercenaries or newer recruits who have less loyalty to the cause, but also like may not have as deep of knowledge, whereas minions of this type are the true believers of the cause. And so they're not going to be as easy to get to to convince that they should switch sides but if you do they have more information you know so that there's a so there's a difference in how you handle those kinds of encounters that's right anything that enhances role play and distinguishes things from each other once again it breaks up the idea of monotony which we described in the uninteresting dungeon that's just like a couple types of similar mooks repeated over and over again and one thing you can do if you're running, like, a, if you're running a published adventure where they didn't have as much space to shake things up, even simple things like switching out an ability or two or in, like, switching out the weapon and things like that can make NPCs feel less like, oh, you know, we're fighting five times thief here. Okay, you know, two of them have, two of them have rapiers and two of them have bows and, like, one of them is actually, like, a bard or whatever. Then that yep. makes things more interesting. Particularly Absolutely. if they have, like... You can have like banter in the combat to have them interacting with each other as things are going down um, to show the personalities of the NPCs as well. And like there is a dungeon in Jade Regent book four that had interesting rooms. But the problem was that the stat blocks of the creatures that were in there were two mook stat blocks repeated over and over again that were also too similar to each other because I think it was like a fighter and a fighter rogue. So I created a bard and an oracle stat block and I started throwing in one bard and one oracle instead of one of the fighters and one of the fighter rogues in every encounter 
and it made it a lot more interesting because the bars and oracles had spells and could take advantage of the unique aspects of each room, whereas the Marshall Mooks could not take advantage of any of the unique aspects of any of the rooms. And then with the spells, too, like if you have spellcasters, changing out a few of the spells that they know or have prepared from one to another can make a huge difference in making that making those encounters and feel having different. the spellcasters meant that they could do something when the pc is used as spells because mm -hmm. i gave the, some of the spellcasters like counter spelling ability and other uh, dispel magic other ability to at least be able to undo things if the pcs were doing them that caused too much of a problem another thing to think about with the dungeon is sort of the you have the interactions between the different NPCs and you also have how they respond when things start to go wrong because, you know, newsflash, PCs coming into your dungeon and attacking everybody is something going terribly wrong. So, you know, do they have a system for alerting each other? Who is willing to support whom in your dungeon and how much time are they going to take to come in and support them and how much personal risk are they willing to take? Often an interesting dungeon will react and change over time as the PCs are delving it. Not always, you can still have an interesting dungeon that doesn't, and that just everything you go to doesn't change over time, but it's just very interesting and you've set it up in advance. So for example, you know, the dungeon might be on low alert when the PCs first come and so they have an easy encounter with some sentries, but the sentries get off the signal whistle and then, you know, suddenly the encounters that are farther in are going to be more dangerous or you have patrols that are going around trying to track down and figure out where the PCs have gone That's or other true. things going on that react dynamically to the PCs. Yes. I'd say that like sometimes you can still have a dungeon that isn't that dynamic, especially if a lot out of things in the dungeon are loners or kind of do their own thing and so have no reason to alert each other. So that's not something you literally have to do every mm -hmm. time to be interesting, but the uninteresting dungeon definitely doesn't yeah. have any reactions in it. And it does that even if the rooms really should have reactions and ways to alert each other because they're all like the same mooks who theoretically should be working together. And even if they're not like going to alert each other, they may take other steps. Like, for example, maybe you have a room where people are just chilling out on break and they're not going to run out, but they're going to take the time to put on their armor and grab their weapon. Or, you know, they're going to take their time to hide their valuables or to, like, plan a strategy for when these intruders come in to try to talk to them and convince the PCs not to attack. Absolutely. And Math Guy Dave brought out a good point where sometimes dungeons can be interesting for one person and not another. For instance, Math Guy Dave made a dungeon that was entirely math puzzles that was interesting for Math Guy Dave, but not for maybe not for the non-mathematician players. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yes. I mean, there I had is, a puzzle... There... And uh, I had a puzzle in one of my games and I had a, I had a session where everyone there was, uh, was doing, uh, was like very into puzzles and we only had three people. And so I made this like obnoxiously complicated puzzle and they spent like 45 minutes on it and wound up making like, the, the solution was like, after, afterwards I like looked at the math that had been used to solve it and I was like, oh my gosh, show me how you did that. Cause that was not how I how I envisioned it but that was really cool I remember because the person who solved it I was like I was like this looks like it's right mm -hmm. but also I just really doubt that we needed to do this to solve this <laughs> puzzle because it just seems like the methodology is so far beyond anything that anyone would ever expect you to do in a puzzle yes but I was like, I think we should try it, even if there's a penalty for getting the wrong answer, because I'm fairly sure that you got the right answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned more about graph theory that day. There you go. <laughs> so it's absolutely true, though, that there are dungeons and there are elements that are correct for one group and aren't for the other. There is no universal standard for the right dungeon. For instance, dungeons that have interesting situations where you could parlay or use a particular group's motivations against another group are generally interesting for most groups, like mm -hmm. a significant majority. But there's some groups that just, they don't care to the point that also they just get upset when the dungeon's inhabitants are living, breathing creatures and they just want to massacre. And then, be then like, you're like, I just want to Killing fight. them and knowing their life story makes me feel sad. So mm -hmm. don't tell me, just, just, have them mindlessly rage at us and attack so that we can kill them guilt-free. And even then, you can still have a, there's still a value to shaking up the inhabitants for the purposes of different combat types. Oh, sure. But th then you don't have to necessarily go as deep into their motivations and things like that for that particular group. Even though for almost all groups, that makes the dungeon more interesting. 
So you definitely have to know your players and your group because one group's interesting dungeon can be another group's TMI, mm-hmm. basically. There's also the matter of what are the rewards for going to the dungeon. You know, sometimes it's you have defeated someone who had who was in your way, but in the same way that uh, you know, one of the principles that goes into like writing any writing definitive things into uh, published Paizo books is if you close a door open to more uh, to look for look for other hooks and ways that this can drive the story forward you know is the does this dungeon give you an opportunity to drop connections to another story hook that you're going to be telling in the future or to introduce a mystery of interest to the characters does it give them something that might spur some other kind of adventure like you have a uh, like you have someone in your party who's really interested in crafting and they found like this legendary metal within the dungeon, but they don't know the techniques for working it. So they're going to need to go on a quest to find a smith who has the secrets of working with this metal or, you know, something else that, that that's interesting to them um, by virtue of being tailored to their interests. You know, every player is different. You know, some players will just be like, well, you know, I love great swords. So if I find an awesome magic great sword, like that's, that's what I want. Uh, and then some players are going to be looking for looking for other things. Maybe they're looking for uh, maybe they're looking for particular knowledge. There's a mystery that their character is interested in. Maybe they're looking for like a new ritual that's going to let them figure something out. Maybe they're looking for you know any number of things. Maybe they're looking for allies. Right. The right reward can take a dungeon that might be otherwise less interesting or even outright a little bit like grueling uh, or painful to go through and make it interesting, especially if they kind of know about the reward in advance. It's kind of like a, oh yeah, this is going to be rough and we know it's rough, but the reward is so is that much sweeter mm-hmm. for the trials and tribulations along the way. One other thing that can help make dungeons interesting is having more than one point of entry. Uh, so, you know, other than the front door, how do you get into it? Is there, like, a secret back entrance that the PCs might be able to find? Might they be able to go in through a window somewhere? Might they be able to climb up to a higher floor and uh, break in or go down a chimney or something? And uh, what happens in each of these alternate routes? Generally, uh, you know, the the I just barge in the front door route is going to be the one that draws the most attention. So if they have some other creative way to come in, they might pass through the dungeon in an, in an unexpected way yep I've although seen... there's one dungeon in curse of the crimson throne that i consider extremely memorable for the fact that mm-hmm. just barging in the front door would probably been fine but there is a there is a seemingly obvious creative way that you can go into it from above that gets you ambushed by like 12 encounters at the same time didn't we dimension door or some nonsense like that no we went through the way that looked like it was an interesting way to get in and the we dimension turned to a different dungeon that was like multiple books before that. Oh right, right, yeah. Into the middle of the dungeon in an arbitrary room full of traps of the snake. I was mostly the remembering the snake god. Of, snake god of, of jerks. I was mostly no, remembering this that. Was yes. Multiple parts later, where we yes, were at the yes, castle. The castle. Okay. And we went in through like the top, and we got attacked by twelve encounters at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes it is dangerous to go in the weird way, like because if you if the weird way brings them closer to the final villain then that, that can be both good and bad because they might be able to skip or bypass some of the things in the beginning of the dungeon, the beginning of the dungeon, but then find themselves face-to-face with harder encounters sooner they, than they expected. Yep, absolutely. So the idea of interesting dungeons, if we collapse it down into just a few things, is that they kind of have a life or personality of their own. Now, that doesn't mean they're literally an avatar that is one of your player character dungeons to circle back to my joke about what is a dungeon at the beginning of the episode. But it does mean that there's a little more to them, even if it's not something you spent a huge amount of time divining before you um, before you created the dungeon, even if it's something you come up with along the way. And that lends them this aspect of sort of authenticity, but also of depth that makes them feel a little more interesting than just like a basic set of like, you know, hallways with doors in them that um, that don't do anything. Another thing with uh, your dungeons is that whoever lives there is going to know the place better than the PCs. 
Uh, one of the common dungeon features you'll see that takes advantage of this is secret doors that allow the inhabitants to go between places faster. Maybe some of them know about the secret doors and others don't, and then that has an impact on, on how things go. Or maybe there are secret doors that even the inhabitants haven't discovered because they're in a room that they don't really use for one reason or another, or they're very hard to find, or there's something else going on with them. Maybe there's, like, passageways throughout the dungeon that are, like, doggy doors that, like, small or tiny-sized creatures can easily use but would take minutes of squeezing uncomfortably for a medium creature to go through. Or maybe and you that have the a inhabitants that has, are yeah. mainly that smaller size, so there's essentially extra hallways that maybe the smaller PZs could use, but the party can't use as a whole, and all the enemies can. Or maybe you have a dungeon where the, you know, the main inhabitants that the PCs come across first never interact with other inhabitants because of some specific reason. Like, for example, uh, you know, you have a dungeon where the first floor, you know, the, the first floor has a, a bunch of people who are gathered together. Uh, maybe it's like a bandit group or whatever. And then, um, and then this, the, there's a basement, but the problem is you can't get to the basement because of the arcane crafts, because that actually leads down into an older complex that has like constructs and undeads and things like that, that, you know, the people who are on the first floor are like, yeah, we're just, we're just not going to touch that room of death. And then if you make it through that room, you can then find a different area. And then, you know, you, you can figure out what does, what is, whatever is below, think about whatever's above. Right. Absolutely. If you bridge that gap. Can you get one set to help you against the other? So all of these dungeons share one thing in common, which is that they make you think a little bit. And that's what makes them a little more interesting. There's a, just a little more to them. They make you think. You don't have to think. You could still go through the dungeons. But if you want to think, there's just just the slightly more depth to them. There are more aspects to them. And they therefore are a little more memorable than just a dungeon that is a bunch of hallways with monsters in in rooms along the way and having sort of optional little puzzles or clues along the way that people can pick up with is another thing that can make your dungeon interesting like you know it might be that sure you can get past a particular door just by it with like a very hard thievery check or something like that but you know if you pick up the if you pick up the chalice from the other room and like read the inscriptions on the wall then you can pour the liquid into the onto the orb and then this is going to cause the door to open naturally yep and it may be that the some of the inhabitants of the dungeon know ways to do things and you're like well wait a minute there doesn't seem to be nobody seemed to have a key how have they been getting through this absolutely well because they know this is what you have to do or maybe like you know you can find the the notes of somebody who was trying to figure out what do you do to break through this door. Mm-hmm. So, I think that I have gone through my tips for interesting dungeons in general. Obviously, there are specific tips and questions that people might have about any one specific dungeon. But with this broad overview of how to make a very uninteresting dungeon that we <laughs> told you first and then how to make an interesting dungeon, I think that you'll be able to quickly level up your games and your dungeons to be stronger than they were I before. I have some more general thoughts. Um, consider, consider modes of movement. Um, consider climbing and swimming and flying and how those will impact things and even things like jumping. How people can use those to move around consider uh use of not just difficult terrain but also things like cover or hazardous terrain as well think about who built the dungeon mm -hmm. if they're flying creatures there could be like pathways that like you have to fly through to get to the next room if whoever built the dungeon is substantially larger or smaller than the pcs that has a big impact on the scale and how things are constructed think about how the people who built the dungeon used it what kinds of rooms would they have had and then how if those if they're very different from the people who are there now how have the people who are there now come to repurpose it are there areas that have been expanded or modified to suit the more modern inhabitant um and has that caused certain things to be revealed or obscured from its original history um traps and hazards are super important too for an interesting dungeon um and having a variety of them too i, I like to see you know one thing that one thing with like uh, simple hazards is that if you have just a trap that goes off and then like nothing else happens and then the PCs just quickly treat wounds, then 
that might tell a little bit of the story, but it's not as interesting as something that, you know, oh, well, you know, you fell into the pit trap and that made a clattering noise and then that caused people to become aware that there was something going on or and you if know, you want to see why these if you want to see why those issue. traps are not good mm -hmm. there's an entire episode of roll for combat live uh last week on youtube that was about not doing those kinds of traps. oh yeah right you just did an episode on that there you go all right well, oh someone said that in the chat too censor uh yeah 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 all right well we don't need to to go into all that then but um yeah does anyone have any questions for us about uh, designing interesting dungeons? Or what you could do to make dungeons more interesting in a particular scenario where you need to use some of those tropes of an uninteresting dungeon. And so, like, it's like, how can you redeem this dungeon? I would say another thing um, to keep in mind for making dungeons interesting is to vary up the pacing in which you go through them, particularly the longer ones, by having some areas that are simpler or safer places to rest and then some areas that are like go 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 that's true if the if the pacing is consistently hectic or consistently lax it's less interesting than if it, it kind of switches around just homogeneity is one of your foes in a dungeon if it becomes so repetitive that it's just like this again then that's the last thing that you want so uh let's see there is a question. Why does it seem that parties randomly decide between kill all enemies and these are my friends and they need redemption? That just... It's that the groups tend to not always have great nuance and so they tend to ward extremes. Yeah. And so that that's why you'll you'll often see the extreme of uh, friendship mode pacifist run and genocide run. Yep. Because, like, how many people played Undertale... And didn't do a pacifist or genocide run. Probably oh, no. a decent number, but but still, a like lot of the people I know who are TTRPG players did one or the other. Did one or the other, uh, for when they were going through. Yeah, but I mean, it is it is interesting though because I think it has to do with sort of like the state of mind. Are you thinking about it more like you know this is a combat simulator and we want to overcome these challenges or are you are you more invested in like what's going on with the story and people do tend to get very into one or the other and yes. i would say that if you have a group that if you have a group that tends more toward one then it can be interesting to introduce situations that would encourage the other like if you have a group that is like we're gonna redeem everybody then you probably want to mix things up every once in a while with like all right you know what this is just a this is just literally a devil or an evil undead. A and mindless zombie. And unrepentantly. You can't redeem the mindless zombie. It has no mind. Unrepentant opponent or like the group that, or, you know, for the group that is very like, oh, we're going to attack everything, you know, having them some things where it's like somebody who comes to them in the dungeon is like, wait, I've, you know, I need some help with this thing. Attack! I'm not working with them. I stab yeah. them. Mm -hmm. I stab this person who says that it was a trick from a doppelganger. All right, then. We'll, we'll can deal with that when you get back to town. It's like, oh, did you rescue this person? Oh, no. no. we thought it was a doppelganger. <laughs> it's not our fault. There were a lot of other doppelgangers. Um, let's see. In situations where uh, repetition seems to be a theme someone mentioned in chat, uh, has a player been known to ask a GM for situational bonuses for... Uh, for repetitious challenges well it's like it's the same type 17 lock, lock trap combo you know there is some value sometimes for repeating a challenge especially if you can have that sort of thing it's like oh yeah you know you've seen this thing before and you know how that works but then as the gm when you're when you're running that you can also you could accelerate narrate past it as that. a montage as a montage it's like ah oh, yes you found more of these and based on your skill before it takes you a minute or two to clean all these out yes. it's the same ones you it found turns out every one of these 20 mm -hmm. um bedrooms is locked with the same lock and yeah. you open them all as well rather than be like all right bedroom number seven i'm feeling lucky let's mm -hmm. roll all of the all let's of roll the all checks. of the things yes exactly yeah so doing that as a montage is a way to break it up because remember, mm -hmm. your your enemy in an interesting dungeon is the monotony of the repetition, just wasting a lot of the in-game time. And using a montage can allow you to, where it makes sense, have repetition without needing to go through it. So, for instance, let's say you have a dungeon where it's like, just no way around it. You've set it up 
and you realize they're just gonna have to be 20 rooms that each have some really basic enemies over and over again maybe mm -hmm. you could do the encounter one or two times and then just be like all right why don't you guys describe to me how you beat this mm -hmm. encounter the other 18 rooms it's like all right you know we figured out that you take a little bit of you're gonna take a little bit of damage each time describe to me like how you beat it and then we can come up with a fair amount of healing resources for you to use. We could just say that you cleared that, the rest of these out and then you need to rest. Mm -hmm. Or that you had to treat wounds for a few hours. Yeah. Like and then you, you took can, care of it. You can come up with ways around it that don't force you to play it out. If you are in that situation where you're forced to mm -hmm. um, put repetition into the dungeon. Or, you know, if there's a way to say, okay, you know, the other guards formed up into a troop. Now you're fighting the guard troop of the guards that get of the moot guards that had gathered up here. And you don't have like the same encounter, but it's thematically, it's the same thing. That's right. So I think we answered everybody's questions. We mm -hmm. gave all of our basic tips. So shall we say goodbye to YouTube? Yes, let's. All right. Bye, YouTube. Bye, See you YouTube. next time.